In terms of your experience interviewing and hiring hundreds of people, if not thousands at Facebook, as well as with TechFester, how do we put that in practice? How do you find people that are going to figure things out? I didn't know when I left Facebook that I would start TechFester. Wasn't on a mood board. We raised a lot of money at the time, about $7 million very quickly within about 30 days. You talked about a word there that every time I hear it, I cannot ignore it, which is leverage. Who are you? Who are your customers? Who do you serve? You can't serve everybody. So who are you serving today? All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Hospitality Edge podcast, the podcast where we bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. And today, I'm very excited to have Shif, founder at TechVestor, with us today. Thank you so much, Shif, for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Sebastian. Yeah. So so let's start. I mean, we, we already had, you know, in the show, Taylor, your uh, head of acquisitions in the show. But, but, but I mean... Talk to us about the founding story of, of TechVestor, what it is, how it came about, and, and sort of just, you know, what it is that you guys are up to these days. Yeah, so TechVestor is one of the first institutional grade short-term rental funds to bring the ability to invest in short-term rentals from a passive perspective. So for anyone out there who's thought about investing into an Airbnb or a short-term rental, hasn't wanted to do any of the work. There hasn't really been a lot of options out there, you know, prior to TechBuster. Uh, so we were one of the first to bring that opportunity to potential investors. And the whole thesis or story behind what we have is we believe that this asset class will be institutionalized more and more over time than where it is today or when we first started. And I think even in the last you know couple of years since we've been running and operating, that's been the case. Right. You have more institutions, you know, kind of peeking their noses into this asset class, the conversations we've had. And when we talked to early investors with us, they, they simply told us, this is way too much work. <laughs> I don't want to do this myself. Right. Finding a property, designing the property, renovating the property, overseeing a property, permitting a property, dealing with guests, dealing with cleans, dealing with repairs, dealing with maintenance, dealing with, you know, anyone who runs a short-term rental truly themselves and understands the depth of scale and the things to run a, a true high-performing Airbnb or short-term rental knows it's a lot of work. And so when we first started, we thought, well, people probably just want their own property. And what we found is that, you know, our early clients actually wanted to invest passively in a portfolio of short-term rentals. They like the idea of being a limited partner. They don't like the idea of being the person who's operating things on a day-to-day. -day. And our thesis back then continues to remain true. We believe that short-term rentals in the future will not only be more institutionalized, but there'll be, you know, people are looking for STR 3.0 or 4.0. It's no longer about IKEA furniture and a place to sleep. It's about oftentimes in the past, you're going to a destination and you need a short-term rental or an Airbnb. We believe the future is you're going to the destination itself, which is the Airbnb itself, right? And I think a lot of the properties we design and put out today reflect that thesis as well. And in terms of the, the founding story there, I mean, you were working with Facebook, right? You you were with them for five years, grew that engineering team from, you know, 80 to, to thousands of people. Where, I mean, where does this idea even come from? And, and I know the timing of you making that decision was also quite bold in terms of, you know, COVID, a kid in the way. So, so where, where does the idea come from and why do you decide to jump in at that particular time? Yeah, you know, I think when, I, when we look at the, the history and experience that both Sabrina and I brought from tech, Sabrina was at Apple building AirPods and she really had more Airbnb and short-term rental experience than I did initially. Um, and I had a background in talent and recruiting and people, building teams like some of the stuff that you just mentioned there. And what we saw in recruiting folks across the country, again, this is pre-pandemic, is we would often put them up in, you know, some sort of furnished housing or some sort of Airbnb. And when you're recruiting senior talent, especially in tech, you kind of roll out the red carpet, right? It's it's not about getting them to work at a place like Facebook or a place like Google. That's kind of the easy part. It sells itself. It's about where are my kids going to go to school? It's about what's, you know, what's my life going to be here? And so they come, you try to show them the city, you try to show them where, where they're going to be moving to, what that's going to look like. And when we looked at these Airbnbs we were putting people up into, they were pretty poor, poorly ran and operated Airbnbs. And as someone who had, you know, in, you know, some sort of knowledge and experience, or at least a curiosity with real estate at the time, 
we asked ourselves, why can't we scale this as an asset class? And at the time, it was related to hypothesis. And we wouldn't start this until I think probably somewhere between six and 18 months after I had left Facebook. To begin with, I was, I was a new dad. So my primary reason actually for leaving Facebook was I was a new dad at the time. And I wanted to be a more present father. And when I became a more present father and just kind of just going through with the things that I was doing, because I mean, I've always been a workaholic my, my whole life. And traveling with a child is super different <laughs> than traveling without a child. And even though my kids were younger, you start looking at things differently. So all of a sudden the hotel room looked a little different to me, you know, booking that hotel room. I'm like, where is my child going to? to be here? Where are they going to play? Where are they going to be able to move around? Are they going to have the things they're going to need? Are they going to be able to sleep, you know, in the right room with the right shades and the right darkness? Because I want to be able to sleep too, <laughs> right? All those things. And so we started looking into like family Airbnbs or things that were family friendly. And we didn't really find a lot of Airbnbs that were family friendly. Now, granted, the homes we design and operate today are not for infants, Right. But, you know, still you start thinking as a father, right. As someone, you know, who has kids, like what would my kids enjoy? And we didn't find that that type of product existed on the market, you know, really in spades. And so we wanted to build that experience. And mm -hmm. that's why we primarily focus on like these larger homes, these higher amenitized homes, but tying that back to the founding story. Sabrina and I kind of came together. We had some early investors. We raised a lot of money at the time, about $7 million very quickly within about 30 days. And, you know, people, people really attach themselves to the understanding of this asset class because they're a user themselves, right? They, they've used Airbnbs. They have kids themselves. They understood what we were trying to do, but they also were willing to take the ride of, Hey, we think this asset class will continue to be more professionalized over time. Wow. Okay. Okay. I want to, I want to understand a few things there. F first is just the timing of it. Like, so what you're saying is you, you first quit Facebook because you wanted to be a press in that. And then 18 months later, you, you launched TechVestor, but what was the what was the mindset when you when you left Facebook? Was it you know I know I'm I'm you know just going to go into entrepreneurship after this, or was it more yeah. of a temporary post and you were thinking of going back into big tech? What was the what was the mindset there? You know, I think I was curious to try other things. I think I was also burnt out. You know, I think for me, and this is just to to get a little personal for a second. You know, I think for me, my father had me when he was in his mid fifties. And I come from immigrant parents who, you know, immigrated to the U.S. in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and I didn't have the closest relationship with my father. And so for me, something that I'd worked very, very hard for from a professional perspective is that when I did have kids, uh, first of all, I wanted to have them young or youngish. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be um, as involved with them as I possibly could. It was a generally a personal goal of mine. And, you know, I had done reasonably well for myself. And so I've said, I think it's time for a break. I wanted to spend some time with my wife. Also at the time, you know, the pandemic was still a thing. You know, it almost felt like you were robbed of those years, right? Of like what you could do, right? Because you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't really travel. You know, we, we lived in California at the time. So things were more shut down than other parts of the country. And we, you know, it was a goal of mine just to do that. I didn't know exactly, I didn't know you know, when I left Facebook that I would start TechBuster. It wasn't, uh, okay. wasn't on a, wasn't on a mood board, wasn't on anything. In fact, when I left Facebook, I actually took a small, I took a small job like 35 days later because I was bored. Um, really? You know, kind of work, you know, working for another tech company. That one only lasted for a few months because I found myself to be, again, curious about building my own thing. And something that, you know, if you, if you ask friends and family around me, they'll tell you that I like to build things. I'm definitely a zero to one kind of guy very early in the process and like i like building that creative that creative component but ultimately i also realized i wanted to be a father first and tying the family approach and what we're building with airbnb to my current personal goals felt a lot of alignment there right i was it felt like i was building properties and homes that my own family would be really interested in enjoying and then i'm just curious because you know you 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 quit Facebook because you want, you know, because you were a bit burnt out, you wanted to be present w with your child. And, and then you're like, okay, let's start, you know, a fund, you know, that's let, yeah. let's start a company that that's gonna, you know, in a way revolutionize the way, you know, short term rentals as an asset class are transacted. So it's like, man, like that you're jumping into something there. 
so I guess yeah, that was that was a conscious decision. You you knew you wanted this to 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 happen. I guess first tell me about it started as a tech company. Like the 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 vision of it started as a as a tech company. How how did it go from you know a tech company that you had in mind at first to to what it is today? What, what when did that pivot happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it was. I think something we did really well in the early days is we pivoted and iterated very quickly. So when we first started, you're right on the money. We we actually thought we were going to build software, and so the reason for it is before we you know I didn't want to start a fund. <laughs> that wasn't day one goal of like let's hey, go do a the fund. Name, the name says it, right? Tech, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But you know, our goal at the beginning was, hey, how can we? You know, I met, you know, knowing Sabrina, we were actually just trying to buy five, 10 Airbnbs ourselves. And if anyone remembers the real estate market in 2021 or like summer of 2021 and kind of through end of 2021, it, you, you would have heard words like highest and best, right? Like there's 14 offers on this house because interest rates were low and all that. And we needed to, if you didn't know about the deal, you were too late already. Right. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to build software that we could better identify the deal up front and how we could, you know, underwrite it as quickly as possible. So we actually built underwriting software and acquisition software that essentially would help us source and underwrite properties before someone else could find it. But, you know, we wanted to be the first to know about it. And we wanted, we started licensing that software and early users would use the software, pay us a little bit of money, they'd find a property and then they would leave. Most people weren't looking for 20 properties. So we had a need mm. a churn problem, and anyone who's familiar with software will tell you that churn and software are a bad thing, <laughs> right? Mm. Like that that doesn't go well in business. So we pivoted to a managed service. That was step two, which was okay. Instead of charging for our software, we're going to charge a service to help you find an Airbnb that fits your goals. We called it an Airbnb in a box or an STR in a box, right? Mm -hmm. It was a done for you. We'll find it. We'll design it. We'll operate it. We'll manage it. You just basically take out the loan. It's your property, and we'll you know we'll figure out the fee and structure from there. We we tested out joint venture model. We tested out taking a flat fee. We tested out a few things. We did like eight of those very quickly, like literally within a month. And we as, keep in mind at the time we were a team of I think like about three people, and we just we didn't know a lot of what we were doing. And when we were on a Zoom, kind of getting feedback from our early clients, something weird. happened. Everyone was almost jealous or curious about other people's properties instead of their own. They were, you know, it was almost like, wow, Sebastian, your property looks amazing, right? You know, I wish I had, I wish I owned that one. And I'm over here sitting like, everyone just got a property. Like what's, why is the grass greener on the other side? What I, what we were picking up on is that people wanted the benefit of the portfolio, but they didn't have the money to own the portfolio. Essentially, what they wanted is they wanted fractional ownership, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of owning 100% of one, they preferred to own 10% of 10, as an example. Mm -hmm. And what they also wanted is they didn't want to operate. They didn't want to be the person dealing with the guests, the cleaners, the permitting. They didn't want to do any of the work. They just wanted this as an investment. They wanted to maybe use it from time to time. That was it. So with that knowledge, we asked, well, hey, do you want to roll this into a portfolio? And we'll just manage this as a portfolio. It's actually easier for us to scale because all of a sudden, instead of it going one to one, it goes one to many, right? Mm -hmm. And so now that became really interesting to us. It allowed us to scale quicker. We thought that would be a model. And when we did that, we you know, basically transitioned those early properties into our first fund. Uh, and then we, you know, that became our new model. We announced that model to our friends and family. Mm -hmm. And we raised about seven million within thirty days. That was that all. By the way, that whole experience happened within about sixty to ninety days. Everything oh, that wow. I shipped. So it was okay. like very quick pivots, listening to what people wanted, how they wanted it, could it work, and you know the rest is history, right? We that's the model we operate in today, and the model we would probably likely operate for the foreseeable future. Interesting, and I mean, both of you coming from big tech. I'm sure that you you had a moment of hesitation there of saying like what 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 are we getting ourselves into like because because the, the the idea at the beginning was tech right so the sure. the whole you know hey this is super scalable you know not as much you know marginal cost for you know extra units sold but then you had a churn problem so of course yes that that makes sense people want the software they bought their property now they're done with the software but like. Was that even a hesitation of saying like we're we're going completely away from 
you know, what we first thought we wanted here? Or were you so into like, well, this is what the market is telling me. So let's just follow what the market is telling us. You know, I think that's a great question. And I think in reflecting back, things were moving so fast that I don't know if we even paused for a second to even question that at the time, uh -huh. right? I think what we knew is there was a lot of things we didn't know and that we needed help, right? Because we had never scaled a short-term rental portfolio or any portfolio really of that size ever before. Uh -huh. um, and so we did what we thought was the right thing to do is we seeked help, right? And I know we're, we'll talk about talent in a second, but one of the first things we did is actually seek the help of advisors. We went out and got people like you know, Scott Shatford from, from AirDNA, Jamie Lane from AirDNA a little bit later. And we have a pretty awesome advisory bench that have deep experience and knowledge in the uh, short-term rental space. People like Emir over at Rabbit, right? All these folks are, are people that I would call both friends and advisors who would advise us on things that challenges would potentially come up, right? And we believe that by having access to things like data, we could at least make informed decisions, right? As to what would be happening. And at the beginning, with everything happening so quickly, we actually didn't expect to build the whole experience. Even with the fund, we expected we would be in the business of, you know, investor relations, raising capital, identifying properties. And then we would, we actually struck deals with companies like Picasa. We were also in talks with, you know, companies like Avance Day and some other ones uh, who would be our property managers, people who would renovate, design the homes right in, in across the markets that we were in, they would source the product. They would essentially be the operator of the homes, right? Mm -hmm. And we would start, we would be the investor and come and we signed with, you know, companies like Picasa. And what we learned very quickly is that our expectation of performance was not their expectation of performance. And by the end of 2021, my team and I, very small team, still about four people, we're sitting around, it's like around New Year's Eve and we're sitting around a fire and we're like, this isn't going to work. You know, working with the Vacasas of the world was not going to be an option that was sustainable or scalable or probably going to deliver the best returns. And mm -hmm. we made the agreement that we would need to build the entire infrastructure from the ground up. And wow. it would be easier today than, you know, if or we were 10, 10 times as big. So that night we built our own, we started our own operating company. And over the next six months, we would start to build and scale and start it and grow it. And, you know, take in-house property management, in-house revenue management, in-house project management, in-house everything. And, you know, looking back, best decision we ever done. I don't think, I don't think you can scale to the scale that we're at today without having that in-house. Uh, and certainly without the, you know, the performance we drive today, I don't think you can drive that without that being in-house. But at the time, it was one of the most terrifying decisions we could, we had. We had properties already. We were like, what do we do? You know, Vacasa's not getting the permits. They're forgetting permits. They're they're also they were going through a time of deep, deep changes. Right? They were losing headcount. They were their service offerings were dwindling. You know, interest rates also in between late twenty one and late twenty two like doubled. Right? Yeah. So you know, everything that could go wrong, <laughs> you know, that no one expected. Everything that's never happened before. Right. In the history of real, like you've never seen real estate, a debt double in 12 months. Right. You know, we expected we would rely on Vacasa. We couldn't rely on Vacasa anymore. And we needed to pivot. We needed to change. And luckily we hired incredible people to, you know, come early who bought into the mission. People like Taylor that you've interviewed in the past. And, you know, the, the narrative to them was like, Hey, please drink the Kool-Aid with us. I think we're going to build something awesome. But I don't know what that journey is going to look like today. But I know I think I think I know where we're headed. And is this something that you can you can buy into? And people like Taylor, people like Mick, people like John, people like Josh, all these folks really bought into to where we're headed. That's amazing. And I wanna I wanna you know dive deep into a few things there. There's the whole you know transition towards bringing things in house and what that process looked like. We're we're gonna talk about that. But but first, I want to talk about that that talent component, and uh, specifically when when you when you were saying you know there were three of you at the beginning, and so let's start with you know a lot of a lot of tef tech companies talk about the whole you know trio of you know a hustler, a hipster, and a hacker, where you have you know uh, you know skills that uh, essentially are complementary in different in different regards, right? I I'm wondering what what that you know combination of skill sets looked like for you at the beginning like the, the three founders was it was it the three founders that you were referring to and and what was sort of the 
the the the the relationship as far as like hey i'm going to be leading this area here and here are my strengths here are your strengths what did that look like at, at the very very beginning yeah i mean really at the beginning it was sabrina and myself right and we actually had a lot of overlapping interests but we okay. had we also had a lot of separate strengths and i use those words differently because i think oftentimes in, in a startup you're you don't always work towards your strengths you work on what's needed right mm -hmm. in terms of what needs to kind of happen on a day-to-day one of the first things we we brought on was our head of finance because you know you're you're dealing with other people's money right having you know true accounting and everything and, and running the books and everything was is critical right like that's just something that we just neither of us really had a lot of deep knowledge of right in terms of how we go with our fourth hire would eventually be austin because our head of revenue but austin at the time was doing everything you know setting up properties acquisition i mean everyone was doing a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, coming into by late January, early February of 2022, I think we were like eight to 15 people. We had, you know, brought on everything from social media help to acquisition help to, to data help to a lot of things, right? Project managers, because we had decided that, hey, we need to go figure out the scale ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that we intentionally built the team that early, to be quite honest with you. I think we got lucky. I think we were opportunistic. I think what we tried to do is we tried to go after people with passion for the industry. And I think you know this very well, Sebastian, in the short-term rental space specifically, there isn't a lot of like industry-bred talent. You have people who come from different parts of their career. They find, they somehow land in short-term rentals and then they apply what they know or, or their interest to some component of that landscape. And so you take Taylor. Taylor was a sales guy back in the day who owned his own properties, but he, and he'll tell you himself, he's a washed up baseball guy, right? Who understands numbers very well, X's and O's and loves underwriting to a T, but he's incredibly creative with how he can view and underwrite and see properties from beginning to end. In talking to him, Taylor actually want us to, to, wanted to start his own fund. That's how we met him, Taylor on Twitter. And I was like, hey, I see you have an interest in short-term rentals and you, you know, I've been following some of your tweets. Uh, you know, here's what we're doing. Do you have an interest in potentially joining us? Taylor's response was, oh, I'm, I'm starting my own fund. Don't, you know, I'm not interested. And I was like, well, why don't we talk about the, some of the things you don't know, right? Because if you think that starting a fund is a one man job is, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot that I can help inform you before you go down that path. And for the next six weeks, I'd meet with Taylor a few times a week to try to essentially encourage him to join us instead of doing his own fund. <laughs> And I think if you ask him, if you ask him today, if he would ever launch his own fund by himself, I think his answer would be absolutely not <laughs> given how much work goes into it. Um, but you know, we, we sourced talent based on passion and this actually goes contrary to a lot of true technical roles, right? Where you're seeking people with specific domain knowledge. And Taylor was one of them. You know, when we met John, who was our fractional head of data, we weren't looking for a head of data. <laughs> you know, we met John and we're like, wow, we need to have this individual on our team. Uh, when we met Mick, who's our head of asset management, we weren't looking for a head of asset management at the time. But when we met him, we met him, we're like, wow, we need to have this person on our team. And mm -hmm. so that's generally how we've gone out to hire for the most part is who fits well within our culture, who is deep passionate for what we're building and can they go figure it out? The number one thing that we generally try to hire for is can this person figure it out? We are in uncharted territories of what we're doing. It's never been done before. It's never been scaled before. There's no, there's no Googling rule book of like how this is going to go work. It's can they go figure it out? Can, are they curious enough? Do they have the passion enough? Do they have enough grit to make it through? And if they do, do they fit within our culture? And if all those things are yeses, this is someone that we probably want to consider to have as part of our team. And I'm curious to know, both in terms of your experience interviewing and hiring, you know, hundreds of, of people, if not thousands at Facebook, as well as with TechVestor, like, let's say, you know, people out there are listening to this. Okay, so how, how do we put that in practice? Like, how do you find people that are going to figure things out? What, what are some of the things that you look for when you're either at that interview stage or at that, you know, just headhunting stage where you're like, okay, you know, you know what, this person's not just talk, this person's going to you know, get things done and, and figure things out. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I learned actually early at Facebook, and I think this is contrary to what a lot of people would believe. I think anyone who's been working at some level of scale, you would expect that person to have 
knowledge of how something works at scale. But that's actually not often the case. Someone who, say, works at Google should know how things work at scale at Facebook because they're both at similar scales. But if that person didn't build that infrastructure, Mm -hmm. they stepped into it. That's a very different person than who needs to build that infrastructure rather than someone who knows how to be successful within it. And so Mm -hmm. for us, you know, one thing we applied is looking at people who had, you know, passion and some sort of experience in short term rentals. And even if they own their own Airbnbs, right? Like using Taylor as an example, right? He had a few of his own properties and he understood the in-depth operation of those properties and acquisition and why he bought them very well. And you ask yourself, can that person, instead of buy two, can you, can they help us buy 20, 200? There's no difference with buying one or a hundred. It's a, it's a repeatable transactional system that has to happen time and time again. Now, where he didn't have knowledge is, com- you know, building a portfolio that's seasonally diversified because that's not mm-hmm. something he's ever done, but that's not something he would do alone. Right. So Taylor would work with me. He would work with John and together that triangle of a trio. And eventually Austin, our head of revenue, as well as Mick, our head of asset management. Now you have a team who's working on building a portfolio. None of us ever have ever built a portfolio individually, but what we each brought was our own individual strengths. So Mm -hmm. when I think about tactically applying this, I think you have to ask yourself, what stage is your company in? Are you looking someone, are you looking for someone to build the infrastructure or are you looking for somebody to succeed in that infrastructure? Even when I was at Facebook, something that we found very, very interesting is that folks we were hiring who were coming from much smaller companies, right? Who were not operating at the scale that Facebook was at, oftentimes had much better in-depth understanding of how to build infrastructure because they were consistently building it for themselves or for their or the companies that they were prior they were prior. The people who you needed to scale systems, right, oftentimes, you know, came from larger tech companies because they had knowledge of scaling. And it actually goes, again, going back to the book that Peter, I think it was Peter Thiel that wrote Zero to One, right? Yep. He does, the Zero to One person and the One to Two or One to Ten are very different things, right? Even just yesterday, I was having lunch with a buddy who's in the in the people and talent space. He's been at companies like, you know, Robinhood and OpenAI and all these, all these places. And, you know, he categorizes himself as a C to Series B guy, right? Because mm-hmm. that's what he understands very well. And who you need for from going from like Series B to a public company is very, very different than what you need from going from seed to Series B. So understanding who you are and what you need at that point in time is a thing that's tactical, but it goes to the same thing when you're building a company. Who are you? Who are your customers? Who do you serve? You can't serve mm-hmm. everybody. So who are you serving today? That's very interesting. And you know, I think part of that conversation about talent is of course, you know, talent acquisition. But there's also the the whole talent, you know, retention and development what? component, which especially if you're bringing on people that you know are are builders, right? Zero to one, where it's more of an attitude thing, more of a let's figure things out thing, right? Like that can work up to a certain stage, but not everyone scales beyond a certain point. So I'm curious to know, especially you guys, you've scaled, you know, very very fast, and so I'm curious to know what what have you done in terms of you know training or developing or just, you know, what, what has worked for you in terms of enabling your team to truly scale with you and, and not be left behind? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I think if you, if you look at our team today and this was a bit accidental is we've hired a lot of entrepreneurs and those are oftentimes the hardest to hire and the hardest to keep because mm-hmm. entrepreneurs are naturally curious they're natural. They have naturally the ability to go figure something out, but they also have a natural tendency to want to be the ones in control or the ones to lead or to go continue building after they solve a problem, they get bored, Mm -hmm. right? They want to go solve other things. And I would say for the last two years, one of my number one goals internally, and everyone on my team will tell you this, it's been trying to keep the team together. And it's not because everyone wants to leave. It's because everyone is so strong in their area of excellence that any one of them could go start a company tomorrow. And we all know that, right? Everyone on our leadership team is incredibly strong in what they do. And if they wanted to tomorrow to go be successful in some other capacities in the short-term rental space, they can go do that. I think what we've done really well at is building something and having a vision 
that is much larger than any one of us can build by ourselves. And uh, we literally have an internal Kool-Aid man with a TechFester logo. There's a little emoji with TechFester and he looks like a purple Kool-Aid. And we we drink the Kool-Aid. We help each other drink the Kool-Aid every day, right? It's it's not easy to build a portfolio of our size individually, but it's possible together. It's, you know, if you look at our vision and mission statement internally, it says your company, right? However, the why is in parentheses. It's, you can read it as your company or our company, right? Mm -hmm. However you want to read it. And it's intentional saying that this is our company. Everyone in our leadership team holds equity in the business. We have no outside funding. We have never taken a dollar from venture. We've never taken a dollar from any investor in TechFest or the company itself. Um, and so we're all owners. We all share in the success of TechFest over time, right? And that's because the best way to align interest, both financially and everything else, is by being an owner, right? Mm -hmm. So we gave out equity from day one. We said, you're going to be an owner in this company if that's what you want to be and you're the right person for this role. If you talk about retention, we also have a sense of family. You know, we have a sense of a uh, team. I would say we're built more like a sports team than we are a family, but we operate and feel like a family, right? Mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Um, Netflix talks about that, right? In terms of like, yeah. it's not a family in that, you know, you need to perform at the end of the day, but yep. you know, we can still, you know, be close and, and have fun. And, uh, and we hold each other accountable every single day, right? We, we also describe ourselves internally as very much a factory. Like I think like a domino effect, right? It kind of goes from, you know, one team to the next team, to the next team, to the next team, to the next team. And it's really needed that the person before you does a really good job. And the person mm -hmm. after you does a really good job. So there's a sense of responsibility. Um, but I think we've also done a really great job of thinking about what we want to build for the future. And really what that is, is we want to continue to build services and options and investing options and performance that can continue to feed and add value to the STR community. And this is something we're all deeply passionate about. Interesting. And I, I, I like what you said there, and I think it's very true as far as like your vision and the vision of the founders needs to be large enough for the vision of, of everyone in, in the team to fit inside of that larger vision, right? Especially when you have, you know, a lot of, a lot of A players like, like you do. So I'm curious to know, was yeah. that natural for you personally to have that, that large of a vision from the get go? And did it come very like, natural or is it something that you had to sort of develop as you were realizing that a lot of these a players you know without without a large enough vision you know would go elsewhere i think if i'm being honest with you and i think if my team was would also give their honest opinion and this is something that i don't think a lot of leaders ever admit to before i even say it i think it's really hard to have such a grand vision so early as a leader because you really don't know the stress that you carry as founder and the responsibility you carry for your team, investors, and all those types of things. There were several times in the early days, Sabrina and I would come together and, you know, we literally would have to tell ourselves, we ha even if we don't believe it today, we have to have a vision that's bigger than anything we could probably imagine. Mm -hmm. We have to lead by example. And sometimes you tell yourself that a hundred or a thousand times that you start to believe it. Yeah, And I know what I'm saying right now goes against the contrary. It's not that we didn't believe in our company. It's that we were human too. You know, the, the, st the stats and odds and everything were against us. You know, never done this before. Never, this has never been happened before in the industry. It's, it's a notoriously difficult thing to scale. The market was crazily changing with interest rates. I mean, everything that we couldn't control was happening, right? And it was super easy just to sit there and be like, well you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Or we could sit there and say, we're going to build this huge vision, huge mission, everything that we're going to want to go do and accomplish. Here's what we're going to do and, and follow us, follow the leader, right? In terms of, mm -hmm. of how that would go. I think that's worked out very well for us. But I would also say that I think that what we've been really lucky with is our team and our leaders internally have contributed to that mission and vision significantly. While we might have seeded the vision, the team itself continues to elevate the mission and the vision every single day because today we're all 100% bought it, right? Into what that can be. But it did start naturally with the leaders at the front. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And as far as like, you know, talking talking more about like what came after, right? So you you, you put in place this amazing team and then you go all in. And, and I just want to understand like, 
specifically in terms of you know you you've said before right it's this has been very hard and 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 knowing what you know now you know all the difficulties that you have had to go through to get to where you are today you don't know if you don't know if you would do it again and and i think a lot of founders you know are in a similar position i'm i'm curious to know what what are some of those areas within the business that you that you think that knowing what you know now perhaps you would have managed differently i mean we talked about started you know by outsourcing certain yeah. areas and now you brought things in house and that's not something you would change is there something you would change in terms of how you started versus how you're doing things today you know when i look back at things i think one of the first things that i i would call out is we were so naive at the beginning and i think that was one of our luckiest moments because you're absolutely right you know i think what we it, knowing what i know today would i start this business today knowing how hard it is to scale and the short answer is probably not there's a lot easier things to probably build and scale now the good news is we've broken through levels of scale to where it actually becomes easier at scale mm, right mm -hmm. so there's different it's 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 almost like a hill right it's like you gotta you gotta continue rising up and up and up but once you're at the top right running down the hill is a lot easier than running up it right and so kind of the wind is in your back not in front of you and mm -hmm. so you know i don't know if there's much we would change in the past i think things happened for a reason i think we would, if knowing what i know now we would have started to build vertical integration i think knowing what i know now i would have probably started by actually trying to raise vc money because i don't know if there would have been other ways to build it right i think knowing what i know now i would have considered you know different talent at different places you know i think we got lucky with people we met along the way and we made certain strategic decisions on who we brought on and when but you know i don't know if there's a lot we would have changed i think we were we were lucky in many ways but i think we were just right time right place at the same time yeah i know that makes sense and everything happens for a reason like you said that's uh, that's interesting and talking about that process of of you know saying hey you know there's a there's a certain break even point you know or there's a certain you know point you go through after which it it starts to become you know easier where where did that point happen for you guys was it in, at a certain number of units was it at a certain like team size and what do you think makes the difference there in is it the economies of scale is it just like the the, the processes you you've built you know at that point yeah, I would actually say I think we I think we we felt breaking through there as early as like this year, and and okay. I think that's surprising to a lot of people. For a very long time, we were you know we were just ag aggressive growth, and we had different problems. You know, I think problems that we face every day that the the average short term rental operator probably doesn't think about is, you know, let's say you have 140 homes. How do you get mail, physical mail, for 140 homes that are distributed across the country to a central location? Right. That's a, that's not a thing you think about. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you handle permitting across, you know, 10 plus states and five different levels of government? So you don't lose, so you don't forget or miss a permit. How mm -hmm. do you, how do you deliver the right supplies across the country when you have a thousand plus checkouts and you're the property manager and you're the owner? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like someone's doing it for you. How do you, how do you build tools from an asset management perspective so that you could, report accurately to investors that there, there's no out of the box tool that exists for this right mm -hmm. so you have to you have to build it and you know i think more recently it has been a number of units because when you build one process you can apply it 140 times right and so naturally the roi on that task feels much more valuable than what would happen if you just had one property Right. Mm -hmm. So now we have, we, and you know, even today we have a full security team 24 seven. Why do we have a security team? Because we learned through operating throughout the last couple of years that we need everything documented, right? We have our, our ring cameras are checked every two hours. Our noise aware systems are checked every X amount of hours, right? All and, and, and logged. Why? Because if we have a dispute, whether it's with you know, on a, a short term rental platform, whether it's with a guest, whether it's with a neighbor, or whether it's with anyone else, you know, as they say, we come with the receipts, right? Mm -hmm. And you learn through this. But like, if you, you know, and for us, you know, you know at our scale, when you're doing a thousand checkouts a month, 
the odds of something like shitty happening every month is is high, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Like something something happens every month, every day, every week, right? It's not it's not boring. You know, if you have six checkouts a month or seven checkouts a month because you have your own Airbnb, like mm -hmm. for you to get to a thousand checkouts, right? That's going to take you twelve years. What well, we're doing, we're, we're doing what happens to an average operator in twelve years in one month. That's the accelerated time pace, right? Of, mm -hmm. of, of how it goes. And when you put those numbers in, into perspective, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built. And we've just recently gotten there. So today, if we go, go add another 50 doors, it's a lot easier to add these 50 doors to own and operate than it was for the last 50 or for the first 50, right? Now, I'm sure it poses its own challenges in that level of growth. But we feel like we'll be good for a while, right? Like I'm sure things will be very different at a thousand doors. But for the yeah, time being, that's what I, think I was we'll going to say. Okay. There's probably there's probably a next, you yeah. know, a next transition point, right? As far as the scale, and then another one, and then. But yeah, I guess one, one at a time, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. I, I'm curious to know, you as a founder, right? How have your contributions or your focus how, how has that evolved from you know the beginning where you have to be involved in everything wearing all the hats doing whatever needs to be done right to get things up and running and and now that you've crossed that first let's call it you know well ma many milestones that you have crossed but let's say that that operational milestone of like now it's it's easier to continue growing than it is or than it was you know a couple of months ago how has your, you know, personal focus evolved? What what are you focused on now as a founder? And what do you think are are your most important contributions that you could be, you know, spending time on? I find myself to be the least educated person in the room more often these days than than ever before, right? And that's a good thing. You know, I used to be the person who created the briefs for our projects in terms of what we were going to do to each home right? For the longest time. Austin, our head of revenue, does that today, right? Because he has he is the most experienced with our portfolio. He knows our homes in and out, how they perform, why they perform the way that they do. Mick is our head of asset management. You know, for when I used to be able to understand the numbers, he understands them 10 times better than I do today. And I say all these things because as a founder, I think I've evolved into leading people, building the culture, making sure that we're heading in the right direction. Um, but mm -hmm. ultimately also recognizing that, and I say this to any founder out there, and I hope anyone here who's a founder will listen to this. I think a big reality to me is I've been the roadblock more often than I've been the solution because I've refused to let go at times. And you learn that very quickly. And my team has been incredible at sharing their feedback. I think they're like, see, we can handle this. We know how to do this. And in fact, when I, when I, when I watch them do what they're excellent at doing, they have significant experience over what I do. And we've hired specialists. I think this is also really important for, for founders and leaders to understand is who did you hire? Like, what does your team composition look like? If you hire generalists primarily, you're going to probably need to have yourself some element of specialization at times. Mm -hmm. If you hire specialists, right, you're probably going to have to need to be more generalized at times as, an, as mm -hmm. a founder. So you're almost the inverse of your team's talent composition. And I found that to be a big reality. So for me, you know, we built a, a, a culture that's very specialized. People are very, very good at the things that they do, kind of like that factory analogy I brought up earlier. So for me, I focus more on how do we bring that together? How do I bring that glue together? How do we communicate better? What tools are we talking about? What's our North Star? If you ask anyone in our company today what our North Star is, they'll tell you. It's hitting a specific cash on cash number for our investors. It's having a specific expense ratio, right? It's like in our mission statement, these are the five things that we want need to do. It's very clear. Everything that we do needs to feed into those goals, right? And everyone's specialized goal goes into there. So, you know, my, my goals today are making sure that we continue to grow sustainably, very important word for us because we, we don't plan on taking outside funding. So how do we continue to grow sustainably? How do we retain talent? Right. For me, I'm huge on building culture. In fact, we, you know, recently we had one individual who was not in leadership leave us. Uh, and he wanted, he took a different role. That was one of the first times anyone has ever left us willingly. 
right? And, you know, from, I called a meeting. I'm like, why did someone leave us? To me, that's a problem. I'm like, why did we, could we not have afforded this person the opportunity for them to grow here, right? And those are the things that I'm focused on because for me, building a team is fantastic. Retaining them is the ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. Retaining top talent will ultimately be the number one differentiator for why we're successful or why we're not. And that's something that I'm deeply, deeply focused in today. Very interesting. That that says a lot too about about the kind of organization that you guys are building. Uh, very interesting. What about you know you were talking about that that north star. So you have your north star right that you need to continue to push for, while at the same time, I mean, it's about doing more of what's working, right? So so that's one one thing. But then at some point, you have to also start thinking. Well, is there a next big thing that we should start? pursuing i'm wondering if you're there i'm wondering if there's a next big thing that you guys have started thinking about or or it's it's still you know the stage of let's just do more of what's working today yeah you know i think we're i think we're at that stage certainly and i think if you were to sit in any one of our leadership meetings you would hear that consistently as kind of like what's next we what we've proven has worked so far from an mm -hmm. operating perspective But what's next means a lot of different things, right? It's about positioning our portfolio for exit, right? At some point. And what does that look like? That's not something we've done before. So that's kind of a mm. little bit of what's next on the tech investor side. We also have thousands of people who come to us looking for certain things, right? Certain services or, or, or offers that we don't offer today. So how can we continue to do that? One of our internal goals since day one has been to build what we call the STROS, the short-term rental operating system. And we view the short-term rental ecosystem as an onion. And the onion has a lot of layers. And we started by building the passive layer of investing in short-term rentals. But there's a lot of layers we have an interest in that we can, you know, defragment out. Right. I think a lot of companies often, you know, they have all these fragmented sources and then they bring them in-house. Right. And that's exactly what we did. Right. However, what a lot of companies often don't do is they ask, you know, they don't ask themselves, how can they now turn those resources? into their own individual services, right? So while we brought everything in house, now we're asking ourselves, how do we defragment again to now continue building the onion? So we own a lot of IP for lack of a better word in the space, right? So do we go out and build, you know, do we take our asset management infrastructure and build software around it for other operators and aggregate data mm -hmm. and aggregate, you know, these types of things? Do we, do we do third party property management, which is not something we do today. We only manage our own properties, right? That's like low hanging fruit. Do we do revenue management as a service, right? Because we believe that human driven revenue management plus, you know, AI is where we believe the optimal future will be for revenue management. These are things that we get asked about every day. We get people who come to us asking them, you know, if we can help them find their own Airbnb for one reason or another whether it's for mm -hmm. their own vacation property, for tax reasons or whatnot. You know, we have people who come to us and say, hey, can you renovate or design my property for me, right? All of these resources are things that we, we solve for internally or take our, you know, I think our permitting infrastructure is fantastic. There's no tool out there that I'm well aware of, and please educate me if I'm wrong, that tracks and monitors your permit status and what to do next and how to do it at scale. And for other property management owners, that's that's a value add if you can do that for your owner that's something we've had to solve for internally so all of these types of things you start to ask yourself how do i bring this to market when we think about a portfolio of brands or a portfolio of companies that we can add value to in the ecosystem i think the core tech vester offer will continue to remain the same but we will certainly look to add value to the short-term rental ecosystem to continue to uplift the the, the ecosystem to begin with Because by uplifting others, we believe that the short-term rental industry itself will continue to mature, right? And mm -hmm. we believe the institutionalization, the maturity of the industry, those are all things that we believe we have a responsibility to contribute to. Interesting. And, and, and I'm curious because this is an ongoing conversation that you're having, as, you, as you've mentioned, you know, in your leadership uh, meetings, this is what's being discussed, which, which of all this, you know, 10 potential opportunities, you know, that you could pursue should you pursue right and and i think this is is the same regardless of what scale a company is at and 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 regardless of you know if whether we're talking about a property management company a technology company i mean you you could do many things 
what's the one thing you should do, right? Because yeah. you can only do so much well. So how, how do you think through that? How do you think through, okay, all of these things we could do, what, what makes more sense? Are you looking, you know, in terms of what, what has the most upside potential? Are you looking in terms of what, what is it that's going to allow us to utilize the existing infrastructure that we have built the most? What is it that we could do with less, less effort? Like, how do you think through that? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a couple of things. And the first thing might actually surprise you. One of the first things we ask ourselves is, will this be fun? And I know that's a very, like, not normal way of looking at things, right? But because we don't have outside investors into the company and we, you know, we don't have to go IP yet, or we don't have to go, there's no pressure to go do these things, right? And the way that we're building the company culture from day one has always been what, you know, liking what we're doing is really important to us, <laughs> right? In terms of a culture. And I think that's why we've had some, some great retention to begin with is we ask ourselves is, will this be fun? Do we want to do this? Do we see ourselves continuing to want to do this? I and mean, if that answer is yes, then we'll continue talking about that, that thing. The second thing we want to ask ourselves on is not necessarily about the infrastructure that we already have, but more so, do we have the right leader to lead it internally? Mm. Because we don't necessarily bet on products or software or tools. We bet on the people who will build them or the people who will lead them. That's been our, that's been our ethos since day one. So do we have that person in-house today? who can go really own and build this other service that we can offer to other people and be essentially what we would call a mini CEO of that business, right? And kind of be that leader. And that answer could be yes, could be no. And if the answer is no, is, you know, do we have an interest in going to find that person, right? We, we can also grow by simply investing in other people or other companies and bringing our infrastructure, our knowledge, our economies of scale to the marketplace through somebody else not necessarily by being the people who bring it to market ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things we can leverage. We can leverage our time. We can leverage our knowledge. We can leverage our experience. We can leverage our infrastructure. We can leverage our talent, right? We can leverage our credibility. We can leverage our, our reach. All of these things are things that, you know, I think any somewhat successful company would, would hopefully consider. It doesn't have to be about us being at the forefront of it. In fact, it'll be very rare, I think, that you'll see that TechFester itself brings other products to market, mm -hmm. right? I think what you'll find is we'll most likely bet on somebody else who, you know, and, you know, invest time, money, energy, resources, something into that person or that team or that product. And, you know, we'll be behind the scenes of making sure and trying to help them grow it, but not necessarily being the ones who run and operate it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we think that the marketplace probably needs better resources and better tools. But oftentimes, one of the first things you have to ask yourself is, are you the right person to bring it to market? And honestly, you know, we're really good at what we do, which is for people who want to invest passively in short-term rentals, that does not mean we're the right people to bring every product in this marketplace to market. So finding the right people is the first goal. No, I love that. And then you talked about a, a word there that every time I hear it, I cannot ignore it, which is leverage. And I like leverage a lot as a, as a word because of everything that it means. And you've probably heard of Naval Ravikant and, you know, he talks about leverage a lot and how you right. know basically it's how you can get more output by the same amount of input and there's different types of leverage you know there's the traditional types of leverage that are basically you you, you require other people to to give you the permission right so there's talent and there's capital both of which you're leveraging and then there's the permissionless you know types of leverage so the the talent uh, sorry the, the the tech and the media Right, which is actually funny enough. The whole reason why I decided to start a podcast was because I'm like, I don't know how to code, but I but I can talk, you know, and I can ask some questions. <laughs> so, yeah. anyways, that's so, just so Brian just started a podcast too. Yeah, the STR it. investing podcast. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. It's so it looks very very good. And and so I'm curious to know if there's something like that framework wise, you know, that you that you use very often, like whether that's you know leverage, whether that's you know the whole the one thing of like, what's the one thing I should be doing now or today or next? Or is there, is there something, is there a framework? Is there a concept? Is there something you, you do daily that you can attribute a lot of your success to? I definitely think something we as a company do very well is every person in this company exclusively works to their strengths. And that is a, 
I don't know if I would consider it a framework, but I would consider it certainly a, a way of life and a way of, a way of working. Um, mm-hmm. so we either work towards our strengths or we work towards our curiosities. We don't work towards anything else, right? It's mm-hmm. a very two-sided thing. You're either working with the skills and experience that brings value to the company, or you're working on some part of your time on the things that keep you engaged and curious, right? To keep going and continuing to learn. Anything that we're not good at, we try to not do, right? And I think that's a very contrary approach to a lot of companies where it's like, let's improve the things you're not good at. We're mm-hmm. quite opposite. It's like, let's double down on the things you're great at, right? Ignore the things you're not good at. It's not expected you're going to be good at everything. Um, and let's leverage that, right? You know, for example, leveraging Taylor and his acquisition. Taylor is fantastic at acquisitions. Taylor is horrendous at many things. And I love him to death and all he can tell you the same thing. Same thing for myself, same thing for Mick, same thing for John, same thing for Sabrina, same thing for anyone else on our team. We all work towards our strengths. We double down on those things. We bring that to the table. And it's a thing that we lead with every time. Anytime we have a key decision we have to make, we ask ourselves, who's the best person to lead it, right? Who's the first best person to own it? Who has the, who has the skills to actually pull it off? And it's ideal if, that per, if the answer to all three of those questions is the same person, right? Because someone who's curious, someone who's strength, uh, strong in that sense, and it's something that they want to do and continue to excel at. If we can't, then we simply ask ourselves, why are we going to do that? Mm-hmm. Does it feed into our ecosystem? That's that's interesting. And yeah, I, I, a lot of the culture, oftentimes the, the, the corporate culture is a lot of, hey, let's let's do development on, on the weaknesses you might have. Let's try to bring you to a, to a level that's balanced in terms of, you know, your skill sets. But no, I like your approach of like, why, you know, why, why not just double down on, on what you're good at? So very good. And I mean, I, I could have you here for hours, I think, Shif, no, no we'll kidding. Do a round I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I think there's been a lot of valuable nuggets in, around talent acquisition, around leadership, entrepreneurship and whatnot. Uh, Anything you'd like to close with in terms of, you know, where people can connect, where people can learn more, if they want to learn more about TechVestor. If anyone wants to learn about TechVestor, feel free to check us out at techvestor.com. We put out a lot of content on on social as well. Um, But if there's uh, anything we can do to help you learn about short-term rentals, get educated on the space, you're curious about the space, reach out to us or anyone anyone on our team. We're certainly a chatty bunch. Uh, so feel free to, to poke at our knowledge and see how we can help and, and kind of go from there. But we but thank you so much, Sebastian, for, for having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Bye.